I titled my message this morning as, Pastor Elijah did a great job putting that up there. I like that. What are you looking at? And he's got a pair of glasses there. And uh, there's a lot of things that our people are looking at these days. Matter of fact, maybe some of you, you got nothing better to do at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You're not working, you're retired, whatever, or you step out for a break and you want to see that thing that's going to happen in the sky tomorrow. Anybody know what we're talking about? You're like, yeah. The, the big eclipse, man. The big eclipse is happening tomorrow. In Michigan, if the sun is shining, how many of you know it's an iffy thing all the time with us? You might, with per, per, something protective, right? You might be able to see a glimpse of this solar eclipse. And uh, people are going to travel. They're probably traveling right now. I saw a clip of people, and on this freeway, they were backed up with their RVs for a five-minute glimpse at a solar eclipse. I've always said people will do what they want to do. Some will spend hundreds of dollars on motel rooms and, and gas and food for a glimpse for maybe three or four minutes of this amazing solar eclipse. Now, I'm not going to fault people for that. You guys know I'm a weather guy. I like to study stuff like that. That's always intrigued me. I like to look at the, Julie will always say, what's the weather tomorrow? What's the weather next week? What's going on? She'll even call me or reach out to me during the day. Is there a storm coming? I just got to stay on my game. So I like to watch and study the stars, and I like to see the things in the sky and God's creation. So yeah, does that intrigue me? Yeah. You think maybe at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon I might be just a little bit curious? and step outside and have maybe a little bit of a glimpse of it. Yeah. People are looking for a lot of things. People are, are, some people are glued to the news. You know what? Lately, I'm just like, you know what? <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> I know a lot of stuff's going on. Oh, man, did you, did you hear the earthquakes this past week? People are glued to it, almost in fear, as some folks are. People are glued to things about the last days. And I'm, you guys know I'm a guy that loves to study the last days. I love to study prophecy. But you know I could get so engrossed in that that I could miss the, pe the people that I need to lead to Jesus Christ and the relationships that I need while God has given me breath to breathe, right? And so air to breathe, I guess. But, so there's a lot of things that people are looking at. People are looking at their own problems. <laughs> Am I talking to anybody? You're looking to your own issues and things that are on your, on your life. And, and uh, sometimes I want to throw my to-do list away. Julie, I just want to throw it away. But that doesn't mean I still don't have responsibilities. You know, I still need to pay the bills. I still need to take care of things. But sometimes your life is all about what's on the to-do list. What do I got to get done today? And uh, we can miss so many things that God has for us. We can miss our joy. We can miss the peace of God. It passes all understanding. So I'm here today to, to encourage you, to challenge you, and to, as pastor, also encourage us as a church body to ask ourselves the question, what are we looking at? What are we looking at? Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18 Many of you know this passage. I'm going to read it to you from the NIV, but there are other words that also can be replaced from different translations. Where there is no revelation or vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law, or we could say the word of God. Father, I pray in these next few moments, let our hearts be in tune with your spirit. Speak to us, Lord, let the Holy Spirit of God guide every word that I share right now. Father, I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The writer of Proverbs is speaking. He's speaking about people that he would hope would live in obedience to the law or the word of God. And as they do, some things would happen. This would be true for us. You live according to the law, the word of God. You're going to experience a consciousness of what it means to live righteous before God, right? The word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
So if I study the word of God, if I hide the word of God in my heart, as the psalmist says to the young man, hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against him. That's how a young man can keep his way pure, living according to the word of God. So if we live according to the word of God, there will be a consciousness of what it means to live righteous before God. You're going to take on the responsibilities of raising your families, the fear and admonition of the Lord, raise them in the house of God, raise them in homes that are God-centered, not earthly, materially centered. You're going to serve Him. And if you live according to the Word of God, you can't help but get vision for your life. Now, sometimes you say, Pastor, it's a little bit clouded at times. Sometimes I'm a bit confused. Sometimes I'm wandering and, will and saying, Lord, where, where are we headed? What's going on? Listen, we've all been a part of those things. But I tell you this morning that there's vision for your life in God and His Word. And there's vision for us as a church. You go into my office, I got handbooks on how to be a pastor of a church and how to be a good church. And I've got all kinds of things about what could be, what are the earmarks of a good church and a blessed church. I need to find out what God wants for us. I'm not saying those things are bad or wrong and they've been good and helpful through the years. But I need to hear from the Lord, and I need to know what the Word says for us today. Amen. So, but I tell you this morning, there's no living in obedience to His Word and failure to follow Him in His plan and plans for your life if you're going in that other direction for yourself. You're aimless. You're unproductive. You're fruitless. This is the opposite that I'm talking about now. Because he says, if you fail to do these, you'll perish. You'll lose out. You'll be lost. We as a church need a fresh vision from God. I'm going to tell you that as a pastor. I want a fresh vision for what God has for us, for our future. And I want that for your life. Now, we say, Pastor, that, this message you should have preached the first Sunday in January when we entered into a new year. This message is for any time of our lives. And for right now, someone here, and I think all, most of us would be included in this, we really need to see Jesus. We really need to see the vision he has for us and for where we're headed. Some of your families, you need it. Some of you need direction in your life. I want direction for us as we move forward as a church. Tonight we're going to share some things with you in our meeting that we believe God is stirring at us and leading us into. But there are different kinds of vision in our lives, and I'm going to share three of them with you. That I want you to consider, I want you to ponder these three kinds of vision in our lives that as we live our lives for the Lord and we desire to experience His blessings, He will fulfill things that he has for us. First one is this, very simply, it's called, and these, if you're taking notes, these are very simple. Earthly vision's the first one. Earthly vision. And I'm going to have several scriptures there, and you take notes, you can read those for yourself later, but I'm going to reference some of them. When we speak of earthly vision, there's two things that come with that. You're either going to look backwards, or you're going to look forward. What about looking back? looking back on your life, looking back as a church. Listen, I, there are times I like to look back at the victories that have been won. I, look to, I like to look back. Matter of fact, I've got this folder that just tells you how long I've been here. i got a folder in my office that says baby dedications. And I was looking at that folder, and I'm like, yeah, I knew it, I knew it. That one that I dedicated, we also went to their open house. Wow, we're Pastor Berger, like, okay, I guess I've been here a while. And I'm like, man, I, I held them as babies on the platform, and I'm going back, yeah, I can remember that. That was awesome. And then I'm up here interviewing them as a high school graduate, going to an open house, and I'm like, Wow, but those are fun things to look at. I got pictures of my, my children. All, my chi all three of my children were water baptized up here. And I have pictures of that, and I go back, and I look, and I think, man, that's amazing, that's awesome. Lord, you're so good. 
You've got all kinds of memories. How many have your Facebook thing and it gives you memories? You can go back 10 years, 13 years, 15 years. And you look back and, and in most cases probably puts a smile on your face. So sometimes it's good because it reflects on the testimonies of God and we know the great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn number 12 in a hymn book, because I know. Yeah, we think of that and, and we reflect on There's nothing wrong with at times in earthly vision to look back at the hallmarks. I can remember times when I was younger where I met with the Lord at this front pew. I can remember that. I remember some times around these altars it's certain times where God spoke and God did a miracle and God did a healing or a young fellow right here getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I can remember those things as if they were today. So it's, it's not a, a bad thing at times to look back, but at other times it's not a good thing because it paralyzes us. It puts us in a place where we can't move forward. We're stuck. You ever felt stuck? You're looking back at those past mistakes you made, those failures you just seem to rehearse in your mind and you can't seem to let go, those wrong decisions that were made, the past fears, the past unfortunate things that came your way. Or it could be the allurements or the attachments of sin of your past that is right there. If you dwell on it enough, it has a way of luring you back. It paralyzes us. Remember the story of Lot's wife. In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 26, she's coming out and guess what she does? She turns around and looks back. We all learned this when we were younger. Most of us know the story. She turned to a pillar of salt. Done. A lesson. Could it be when she was leaving, as most of us would imagine, she was remembering all of her friends and all of the things back home, and out of curiosity or out of sadness of heart or out of maybe second guessing, turns around for just a split moment. And God said, don't turn around. Don't look back. There are things in our lives we just can't go looking back towards. We just can't go looking back towards. Some things have been buried, and don't you dare grab a shovel and start digging it back up. Come on, don't you start digging it back up. Or sitting there by that, that hole where you buried it, so to speak, and say, well, hmm. You know, you start pondering too long, the next thing you do, you're going to pick up that shovel. You're going to start moving in that direction that's going to be harmful to you and keep you from moving forward. Jesus said in 9.26 of Luke, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Try plowing a field while constantly looking back. You're lying. <laughs> if, you, if you try planting something, you're a gardener and you're planting, and if you keep looking back while you're trying to make the road, this road's going to get out of control. It's going to go one way or the other, and you're going to lose focus, and things are going to not pan out the way you thought. Yeah. Don't put your hand to the plow and then start looking backwards. Keep moving forward. Paul says, I keep my eyes on the prize. I keep looking forward. That's it. You're either looking backward or you're looking forward. Philippians 3.13, But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. When we think of that word straining, I mean, that takes some focus and work. It doesn't just happen. There's a, a consciousness. There's a decision that has to be made. And sometimes on a daily basis. I can't go back to that. I can't look back to that. I've got to keep my eyes this way, moving forward. Fix your minds and your hearts on the promises of God for you, your family, your future, for the church. And I look back and I say, you know, after 20 some years now, I'm like, man, I did make a few mistakes in the past, and yes, I did. But I can't dwell on those things. Hopefully I've learned from them. 
Ask God to help me as we move forward for Him. Learn of Him. Grow in Him. Meditate on His Word. Again, the efforts that must be made in this. You can look at the difficulties or the possibilities. The difficulties or the possibilities. First of all, let's talk about these difficulties we face, and they are many for all of us here this morning. If we focus on the difficulties for too long, they have the potential to discourage you, to bring you down, and tragically for some folks, to lose hope. And I was reminded by someone who spoke to me recently. They said, too often we find ourselves looking at the waves rather than at Jesus. The waves in our life represent so many things. You know, Peter walked to Jesus on the water, right? But he got his eyes on the waves, his circumstance, his difficulty out there on the water. The things that didn't make sense, because how in the world am I doing this? Your problems, your needs, your fears. You do that long enough, you start to sink getting your eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ. He started to feel like he was going to die and perish out there as he began to sink into the waters that were over his head. Maybe some folks feel that way at times. The difficulties seem to overwhelm you. You're so focused on those things, those earthly things. Have you ever gotten worked up about things that maybe you wish you hadn't have because it's just a material thing? Yeah, I, I do that. You do that. If we're honest, there's things we're, we're so focused on. The spring is coming, and I'm thinking, my tractor needs to be fixed. I, I got this that's got to be done, and I got this to be done. And I'm like, ah, how am I going to get it all done? Anybody the same way? I, at times, you're like, I got all of this. Not, it's springtime. I'm out there cleaning up the brush and all the branches that fell down, and I'm thinking, Lord, I got so much to do whether it's the things you feel you need to do or the things that weigh you down. I encourage you this morning in those earthly things to give them to Jesus. Think of the possibilities. We sing that song about God is able. And I love that song. Your God is able to deliver you. You talk about difficulties. You talk about a struggle. You talk about putting your life on the line. Think of those three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think of them. They're not going to bow. They're going to pay the ultimate price. They're thrown into the fiery furnace. Guess what? They all of a sudden, those are out there, look, the fourth, there's another one in the fire. Uh, didn't we throw three in there? How come there's a fourth one in there? I wish we could have been there to see that. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been awesome? It's like, wait a minute. I thought we threw three in there, but there's four. Where did the fourth one come on? <gasps> he looks like the Son of God. They come out. They don't even smell like smoke. Can you imagine that? They're not burned up, smoke, they don't smell. They come out awesome into the glory of God. And listen, so many of us are finding ourselves being, like we feel like, oh, I'm being thrown in the pit, the fiery furnace. Listen, God has a way, like with Daniel, he closed up the mouths of the lions. You know, these are some of the, for some of you, these are the stories you learned when you were a child, but we forget. We forget. If God, we serve the same God. You serve the same God this morning. And he's thinking of you. He's thinking of what you're going through right now. And he is able to deliver you. Praise the Lord. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them who are called according to his purpose. So what earthly things are you focused on today? What are you looking at today? Secondly, there's heavenly vision. 
as I've already said before, it's important in our heavenly vision to look to Jesus. He's the, he's the captain of the host of heaven. He's the one that's coming back for his church in the sky. He's the one who's coming back and rule and reign for a thousand years as he comes back on his triumphant white horse. He's the one in whom you're going to embrace someday when you see him face to face. He is your salvation. As the song goes, he's mighty to save. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us, there is no other name under heaven whereby you can be saved. There isn't no one on this planet that can save you eternally except Jesus. And I love the biblical account in John chapter 12 and verse 12 where there were some Greek men who attended the Passover feast. I mean, we're not talking these... I mean, we're talking the, the outsiders are coming in out of curiosity. And they're coming into the city at the Passover feast in Jerusalem... They see Philip, a disciple, and their words to him were this. We would like to see Jesus. Well, who am I? I'm, I'm one of his disciples. No, I know you're... I want to, we want to see Jesus. He is your answer to everything that's being faced in your life. He is the right now for you. We would see Jesus. When you came through the doors this morning in this corporate gathering of the church, I'm sure you came to see your brothers, your sisters in the Lord, your family. Come to hear me preach. <laughs> but you know what? You came to see and meet Jesus. Because I've got to tell you, folks, he's here. He's here. He said he would be with us. He says, I dwell among the praises of my people. Heaven is already open to us. We don't even have to say, Lord, open heaven, because heaven's already open. Because he's here right now. The one in whom we talked about at communion, when we read the scriptures in Romans, who was given up for us, uh, who is the one that, that has, has paid the price. He is here right now for your healing, for your need, for your miracle, for your answer to your prayer. We would see Jesus today. We read from Romans 8.34 just a moment ago at communion where we read that he is at the right hand of the Father in heaven praying for you. It's also referenced in Luke 22, verse 69 and other passages as well. He is ever interceding for you. So will you not look heavenward? Because this world is not your forever home. I hope your feet aren't planted too strong in this planet, in this earth, because this planet, this earth, is not your forever home as we see it today. Jesus told the disciples in John 14, 3, he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you will be also. What a promise. Some of you that know your hymn books, I have a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. I'm looking heavenward. We're even told by Jesus. Are you troubled by the signs of the world? Are you troubled by the things that you see happening in the world? And you say, Lord, these things, these things that are happening, they look like they're lining up with the word of God and what you said would be happening prior to your coming. And he says, look, rejoice, for your redemption draws nigh. He's coming again. He's coming soon. Cultivate in your life that you will labor in love for the Lord. Those who look heavenward want to be doing something for Him. Laboring in love for the Lord. Have you ever felt tired recently and wore out? <laughs> Should I raise my hand? <laughs> Galatians 6, 9. Don't become weary in well-doing. For in due season you will reap if you faint not. Did you catch that there? You will reap if you faint not. It is his will for you to be.
begin to see things happen and harvest. You labor in that garden this spring and into the summer, and you keep going back at it, and you're like, man, I just can't wait to see what this harvest will bring. Don't fake. The sun's going to get hot and bright. You might have to grab your water spigot and your hose and water. And you know what? Anybody enjoy pulling weeds? It's not the most fun thing to do. But you'll reap if you faint not. Church, we cannot be a church that faints. We cannot be a church that loses heart. We cannot be a people that says, I've come this far and now I quit. And I'm thankful that God is raising up younger generations. Because we will not faint. We will not give up. We will not grow weary. But we will reap in due season. I believe we're on the precipice of a season. I really believe it with all my heart. We're called by Jesus to lay up treasures where? In heaven, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. And someday the Lord will say in Matthew 25 and 21, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What are you looking at today? And lastly, the kingdom vision. The kingdom vision. For you and I personally, and for the church, I take us to this point again. And remembering our text this morning in Proverbs 29 and 18, where there's no vision or vision, the people cast off restraint or perish. But blessed is he who keeps the law. And again, we talked about, we tie it into the word of the Lord in this whole thing. Now, I've been called to pastor, to equip you, Ephesians chapter 4, to send you forth in ministry, that you would do works of service, to commission you forth with vision. I read this many years ago, and I, it stuck with me. A church can be known of one of three things, undertakers, caretakers, or risk takers. Something to ponder for a moment when you think about where we are and where God is taking us. Risk takers are like Peter. It's time to get out of the boat. Like an athlete, it's time to get off the bench and enter the game. Like a message a couple weeks ago, it's time to get off the shore and get into the waters that are deep enough to swim in. Let the Holy Spirit lead us sung a song earlier, Holy Spirit, rain down. Oh, Holy Spirit, take us into the deeper waters of where the current of the Spirit wants to take us and let us keep our eyes on Jesus. To fulfill the kingdom vision, that is what Jesus desires for all of us here this morning. In His prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is as heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I want to experience the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God in these days. We have been given the power and the authority and the keys of the kingdom. Think of it for a moment. Believers, the church of God, we've been given this authority. Mark chapter 16, go back and read it again. We're to be fishers of men. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. I'm going to list these real quick. Not only are we to be fishers of men, but we are to be full of the Spirit. Acts 1 and verse 8. Church, we've got to rely on God. You've got to rely on God. We as a congregation must rely on God. Psalm 127 and verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. We faint. We grow weary. I love our ministries. Man, God's been just flourishing in many ministries of our church. Things are happening and growth is happening. But programs is not where it's at. Even all of our little ministries and the things, we're all it. We don't comp compete one ministry against each other. It's not the plans of man. It's the plans of God. 
I don't tell the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, this is what we're doing, so come along and bless us. I, I want to say, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want us to do that you will bless? I don't sit in the driver's seat. The Lord sits in the driver's seat. He's the one who is the head of the church, not me or anyone else and the leaders of the church. We are to be united in love and vision and purpose. Did you hear me? We're to be united in love and vision and purpose. In Luke 11, verse 17, Jesus gives us a strong, strong warning. A house divided against itself will fall. We must always strive, strive for and promote unity within the body of Christ. The enemy would like nothing more than to do this. So disunity, so discontent, and stir up personal judgments about others in the body of Christ. Listen, my friends, that has not to happen. That cannot happen because those are the tools of the enemy against the church. It's one of the greatest arsenals that Satan has to hinder the work of the church in these days that we're living in. We all have different ideas and different opinions. I get that. We're a body. We're, we come from different ideas and backgrounds. But we must flow in the unity of the Spirit of God. When the Holy Spirit came down in the day of Pentecost, they were, in the, they were all in one accord. You want the Holy Ghost to move among us? we got to stay in one accord. And when that temptation comes to stir up something and be a troublemaker, come on. You're falling into the path. You're falling into the work of the enemy. And I encourage you, seek out your path. Seek me out. Seek out a leader. Seek out someone you can talk to. But allow the Holy Spirit to keep you in the right spirit, in the right attitude of your mind and your heart. We must experience the Lord's glorious presence. I encourage you personally and us as a corporate body to press into the Lord and His presence. I love our altar call times. But it's beyond altar call. It's in life groups when we have fellowship together, when we pray together, when we meet each other during the week over coffee or in someone's home. Listen, that's doing life and that's being the body. We press into the Lord. To have a kingdom vision means you are personally praying and believing. Psalm 26, verse 8. I love the house where you live, O Lord. Oh, the place where your glory dwells. So I love to be together with you. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There was an excitement. There was a desire. We keep meeting together, Hebrews 10 too, all the more as we see the day approaching to encourage each other in our faith. Yes, and finally, we got to be people that pray. For to have a kingdom vision, we must Heed the words of Jesus who said in Matthew 26 and 41, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. You know what he said further? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Luke 18 and verse 1, Jesus said these words, men ought always to pray and not faint. And I'm pausing for just a quick moment here. My wife and I have had this conversation. Men, I'm going to be calling on you very soon to meet with me to pray. You hear me, men? There is something in my spirit, and my wife and I have talked about this. We're moving forward with God, and the enemy is doing everything in his power I'm not afraid of the enemy, but we know his work. And we, and I, I know women, you need to be women of prayer, but men, we need to be men of prayer, and I'm going to be calling you in the near future. We'll figure out a time and a place. He's probably right here. <laughs> probably this is the best place. This is the best place. I don't think going to the coffee shop's the best place. And we're going to pray. I need your prayers. I need your prayers. We're in the business of saving lives that are headed to a road of destruction. 
And as shaking happens in the world, God is looking to his church. And this is the hour. This is the hour. And I feel honored. You should feel honored of the Lord that you are living in these days. And there have been those who have labored before us. We've had several in the last 18 months who are now with Jesus, who sat in these very chairs in the last 18 months. And they have walked into the presence of the Lord. They've receiving and are receiving their reward. But we still, with a great cloud of witnesses up there in heaven, my goodness, I've been here 20 years, Pastor Berger. You've been here longer. Between the two of us, it's 50 years. Probably this whole church building could be filled with people, Pastor Berger, that are on the other side. Wow! Wow! You get excited when the church is full on a Sunday morning. Think about 50 years of people that have gone on to be with Jesus. We could double our size. It's crazy to think about. But we ourselves cannot lose the focus. We can't lose the mark. We have to keep our eyes heavenward. We've got to be people that know how to pray because we're wrestling against the forces of darkness. From the days we were at goodness, I'm closing my notes up, <laughs> giving you some hope. From the days of the Christmas journey in December until right up to this time today, who knows what God is doing? I, only he knows. The enemy knows what he's up to. He's a liar and a destroyer and a thief. Call him for what he is. But there's been something in the spirit realm that I, as your pastor, have been sensing and feeling with greater intensity than all my 20 years. I tell you, folks, when we start moving in faith and we start all coming together, when we start all coming together in unity, the enemy's going to do everything in his power to try to trip us up and to stir us up, to take out your pastor, to take out his wife, to take out the family, to take out the deacons, to take out the leaders, to cause trouble in the church. I'm going to tell you something. That's what the enemy wants to do. He's been at it a long time. And I tell you this morning, I know what I'm looking at. I'm looking at Jesus. Jesus, we are your church. We come together to worship. Might not be always the songs you want to sing, but you come to worship Jesus. It might be a little bit different from time to time, but that's okay. We're the corporate body. We've come to lift up our Savior Jesus, who is leading us. We're marching forward. He's the head of the army, and you're enlisted if you know Jesus. The same Jesus who have you seen go into heaven, will come in same like manner. And we're living in those moments. We're living in those days. And when he comes, I want to see us working. I want him to see us working and laboring for him. I want us, I, I, the whole church body, children, young people, young adults, seniors, hallelujah, that we're doing the work that God has called us to do. Because as we move forward, we have to have him at the center as the song goes. Jesus at the center of it all. I think we need to sing that one soon again. That's been on my heart. What I want you to do is bow your heads with me as they come. This is a message that I could just, mm. Lord, I pray for your help right now. Lord, I pray, I pray, I pray that Lord, every one of us,